All right, everybody, welcome. It is 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome. We've got 41 people in so far. It's pretty cool. Uh, this is Stage Lighting, Plots, and Paperwork. So I'll preface, preface this by saying this is a intro level thing to plots and paperwork. So if you know a lot about lighting plots and paperwork and stuff, it might, might not be as interesting to you. But on Thursday night, I will be doing more of a deep dive into my Vectorworks and Lightrite workflow. So this course is more geared towards students and people who are just starting out. Um, we're gonna go over kind of an overview of all different kinds of lighting paperwork and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, first, a couple of quick Zoom housekeeping things. If you haven't already, you're gonna to wanna to open your participants tab as well as your chat tab. The participants tab, I believe, depending on which client you're using, you should see either in your bottom bar or up at the top. And what that'll allow you to do is it gives you some controls on voting as well as uh, allows you to raise your hand or lower your hand, as well as if you want me to go faster or go a little bit slower, there's some buttons for that as well. If you open up your chat tab or your chat window, sometimes I'll ask questions uh, or I'll ask if you have any questions and if you don't wanna jump up on video or audio, you're welcome to just type them in the chat and I'll get to them as soon as I can within the session. So other than that, let's see, anything else I'm missing? Uh, just as a reminder, this will be posted on YouTube as soon as possible. All of the rest of the sessions I've done so far are currently on my YouTube channel. Um, so please go check that out. But if by being here, if you do decide to jump on video or anything like that, you do give your permission for me to use that on, on the recording of this video. One other thing you'll need uh, for this, sorry, Sebastian, I should have mentioned this when you, when you ask it in the chat, you'll need a, just a single sheet of paper. So any kind of paper will do. We're gonna do a little uh, demo uh, halfway through, halfway through the, the session. So any sheet of paper can be a piece of notebook paper, printer paper, whatever. Keep that off to the side. So a little bit about me to get started. I'm gonna keep this quick because I know most of you either know me or have you done one of my classes before. I am Mike Wood, I'm a Nashville-based lighting designer and educator. I work all over the country. I'm the resident LD down in Atlanta at City Springs Theater Company. I've also done a lot of audio work, systems design, a little bit of everything you can think of. But I've, uh, I've worked on the faculties of several educational institutions around the country as well. So it's a performing arts school in Tampa, community college in Tampa, a private school in New York, and most recently Marymount Manhattan, where I taught a lighting design and a lighting mechanics course. So that's me in a nutshell. Most of you probably know me from Instagram. Please come check out my Instagram. I post a lot of cool content there, a lot of behind the scenes stuff, whenever we might be able to go behind the scenes again, we'll see. And then, of course, my YouTube channel here, youtube.com slash MikeWoodLD. That'll be where all these videos get posted as soon as possible. Okay, enough housekeeping. Let's jump in. So this is my favorite thing to talk about is lighting paperwork. As many of you know, I, I do a lot of various pieces of paperwork. If you were here with me on Sunday, you saw my paperwork management portal in action. Uh, if you missed that, come check it out on my YouTube page. But all of those, all of the demos I've done, all the stuff I share, I think it all can be boiled down to one simple chart, and that's this. The lighting design is 95% paperwork and about 5% actual lighting. I feel like the majority of the work that I'm doing is paperwork and prep work before I even get to a theater, before I even have a chance to turn a light on. Uh, this, this slide five years ago was a 90-10 a split, and I updated it for this presentation to go to a 95-5, because it feels like now, with everything being a moving light, everything being an LED, the, the more, more parameters we have, the more paperwork we need. So there's my new percentages for you. So key terms we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about focus areas and what those are, talk about lighting plots and all the various forms that can take. We'll talk about instrument schedules. Ooh, that's, we've got a storm going on, so lightning just hit. So if I do cut off abruptly, it's because I've lost power. Instrument schedules, we've got dimmer hookups, channel hookups, all of these things. We'll talk a little bit about the differences between channel hookups as well as the channel hookups, dimmer hookups, circuit hookups, as well as what those three words mean for those of you who are very new to lighting. We'll talk about cheat sheets. We'll talk about some schedules, magic sheets, cue sheets, and tracking sheets. So a little bit of everything we're gonna talk about today. The software we're gonna talk about today mostly is Vectorworks and Lightrite. We'll talk a little bit about Google Sheets and Excel as well as InDesign, which I should probably add to this. There we go, Adobe InDesign. The None of this is gonna be a super deep dive into any one of these pieces of software. Those are all gonna come later on. This is more, again, more of an overview. 
So why would we need lighting paperwork? What I like to what I like to equate it to to people who are new to this is why would you ever build anything unless you have blueprints? You know, the lighting paperwork package has the complete documentation that we need in order to make the show happen. All that information, I like to say, it has to be clear, concise, and complete. So I want everything that could potentially be a question that's going to come up, I want that to be answered in that paperwork. So I want to be able to turn in this paperwork package and know that the electricians, the production managers, whoever needs it is going to be able to find every piece of information they need inside of that, that paperwork package. I'll give you an example. If, if let's say you're going on a vacation or something a couple weeks before uh, a tech process or before a loaded, and that's happened before. I've been in that situation before where I'm going to be out of town or even out of the country without, without cell phone signal. I want to make sure that anything that I can potentially kind of nip off sorry lightning is getting worse anything that I can anything that I can answer for those production managers and for those electricians before I go is going to be useful and it's going to help the show so clear concise and complete and I you know the, the amount of times I've said if, if you if those of you who are, who are teachers you've probably said many times check your syllabus it's in the syllabus right I like to do the same thing but within the paperwork you know I try to make sure that I can always answer the question with it's in the paperwork now, those of you, I, I've got a couple of my production electricians I see that are on this this participant list. You might you might say, wait a second, you've I've, you've left some stuff out before, and that's true. These are just goals to strive for, not necessarily perfection all the time. So clear, concise, and complete. My paperwork kind of has a lifespan that looks like this. So it starts up here at the top with uh, preliminary documents. So this would be our rough drafts. This would be the first ideas we have before we've really bid anything out, as we're st even sometimes before the scenery is even finished. So this is where we're coming up with those ideas for the first time and getting them down onto paper. From there, we go into what we call the submittal copies. So these submittals would be what I'm actually sending to the theater company to say, this is what I want. This is this is what I'm asking for. Sometimes the shop has been involved at this point. Sometimes it hasn't. Um, it really just depends on the company in a particular show. And then, of course, these other things are things that everybody here is probably familiar with. You've got load in, you've got focus, you've got tech and then finally an archive. So each one of those steps, there could be five or six different revisions worth of software, or revisions worth of paperwork within each one of those major uh, steps of the process. So if you were with me on Sunday, you know that I like to have a, 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 I have a, have a numbering system that I stick to. I, I have letters and numbers. So basically anything that's in this prelim submittal phase here, this stuff right here, that's gonna be A. Load in is gonna be B. Anything in during focus or check, uh, tech, those are revision C, and anything in the archive is going to be D. And then within those, I might say AO1, AO2, excuse my bad mouse writing there, but you get the idea. So the, the, the thing that's important about that is that every single piece of paperwork that I print, be it light plot or instrument schedule or anything, is going to have that number or that letter and number combination code on it. So that as an electrician, I, if, if I was the electrician on that show and I was looking at a piece of paperwork that said submittal, but I'm in the middle of focus, I might say, wait a second, this is not the right piece of paperwork. I need to go find the right one. And I always make sure, and you'll see this in a second, that within a Dropbox or within a Google Drive, that all of that stuff is organized by folder that also has that letter and number scheme. And anything that is not current is moved to an archive folder. So it's very clear what is the current copy and what is not the current copy. Okay, there we go. So again, come up with a version. So that's my system, that ABCD. I used to have an E as well. I just shrunk it down a little bit. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you have a system and you stick to that system. So if you're, if you're running, if you were running your own venue and you're doing all of your own paperwork and everything, still come up with a system and stick to it for that venue. It doesn't have to be perfect on the first try. You can get uh, everybody. Yeah, make sure we keep our mics muted. Thank you. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect on the first try. As long as you come up with, as long as you're working on making that system happen for yourself. So for me and my team, we're very used to this system now. But it's not. I mean, it didn't come out of the gate fully formed like this. It started as just numbers, and then I added letters, and so et cetera, et cetera. Everybody in this call has probably gotten a file before from somebody that's called scenic final final 2.dwg or for those of you who are still in school you've probably saved word documents that say final paper final version 2 final for real this time dot doc right 
there's nothing worse than that. You know, when I'm sent a file or if I'm given a, a Dropbox folder that's full of files that are named like that, there's no way for me to know what I'm supposed to be using and what I'm not. And you know, you might think, okay, well look at the modification timestamps. And that could be true, but even then that might not be. You know, I might somebody might have opened the other one and accidentally modified something. So having that really concise and clear version tracking system throughout the entire process is super, super important. So if there's production managers who are, who are on this call right now who are dealing with different designers, please make that a thing in your theater. Make it so that anything that's turned in, keep those drives organized, keep those things up to date with some kind of a tracking system where we all know what the current thing is. Um, use Google Drive, use Dropbox, use Box, literally use anything other than email to share files. Um, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. But the other thing then is maintaining a private working folder and a public exports folder. So what I mean by that, uh, this, is, this is more having to do with you as a designer uh, or you as a team of designers. You should always have all of your, let's say your Vectorworks files, all that stuff that actually is the building blocks of your show in a private, private shared folder that isn't shared with the entire company as a whole. So an example for that, I know, you know, for a lot of shows right now, there's a lot, you know, you'll be invited to a Google Drive or a Dropbox that has every single person involved with the show, including advertising, marketing, the front of house people, all of that stuff in there. I don't want the Mary from the box office to be able to accidentally delete my Vectorworks file out of the, out of the Dropbox. Now that's a whole different conversation about backups, but you get the idea, right? So anything that's like that, I wanna keep just within my team and only the people who know it. Saving even the conversation about intellectual property and all that kind of stuff. The other side of that is in the public folder. So this would be the stuff that I would put into a production-wide Dropbox or Google Drive. This is usually PDFs or copies of the Vectorworks or LightWrite files that people might need, but all of that original stuff that I use for my creation is happening in a, in a private folder. So put all of those updates in those shared folders. This is my, my biggest pet peeve is emailing paperwork of any kind when it comes to, it comes to a show. It seems dumb, I realize, but even like when I'm emailed a PDF of a schedule, that, that it drives me nuts because that schedule is going to change probably within 20 minutes of that email being sent. And now people are not easily accessing the most recent documentation. So my rule of thumb is any kind of paperwork that is sent out, instead of sending it out as, as an email attachment, I'm putting it in the drive or in the Google Drive, Google, <laughs> either in the drive or in the Dropbox. And then I'm emailing people either with a link to that folder or I'm just telling them that it's updated in the, in the drive or the box. Um, and again, that's all about version tracking because I've, I've been in that situation where I've got six different emails from a stage manager all containing a schedule. And you know, yeah, I, I, I can, if I'm in the moment, I can probably figure out what it is, but if I'm trying to find it quickly on my phone and I'm going through 20 different emails and going through all this stuff, it's really hard to do. And I'm sure most people in this call have, uh, most people have, have dealt with that before. A question just came in, can I go over my folder organization again? Yes, I will absolutely do that. I'll do that a better version of than of just the, the slide here in one second. So yeah, so don't email paperwork. Uh, next thing, have backups. Backups are the most important thing you can possibly have. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's no reason in 2020 we should ever be suffering from any kind of data loss incidents anymore. For example, again, if it's in Google Drive or in Dropbox, there are already backups of, of it that exist. Even in the free plans, that stuff is, is somewhat protected from deletion. And of course, if you're paying, there's even more. So for instance, when I put a, a PDF or anything like that into a Dropbox folder, not only is it in the Dropbox, it's also then saved on every single person's computer who has that Dropbox, as well as all of their backup time machine drives, as well as my time machine drive. So it's it's there's 50 copies of a file f that are saved as soon as you do something like that so you can see the the, the benefit of it okay back us back us. and then of course the other golden rule here is do not delete something from a shared folder unless you own it that hopefully goes without saying mm -hmm. so the question came in to go over my my paperwork process a little bit and my gopro just shut down i was trying to record this separately so let me change my screen share here for one second and I can show you a better example of this. Show you my main screen. Okay. So you should be able to see my main screen now. I don't know why I 
can't open a finder window. Do it this way. So let's go, for example, to, hmm, what's a good one? Footloose in the park. So this is a good example of a private and a public folder kind of working side by side. So I actually have three folders. I also have a private private folder and this contains things like my contracts and stuff like that that even my team doesn't have. It's just my my personal documentation on the show. But within the working folder, we have it organized uh, by number. So 01 is drafting in Lightrite. So anything the Vectorworks file goes in there, the Lightrite file goes in there. Of course, I have an archive file in there as well. Second folder is my PMP file, which is the paperwork management portal that you saw on Sunday. Third folder is scenery. So there's not much in this working folder because this show just got canceled, <laughs> but you can see this is where any kind of SketchUp models, anything I get from the scenic department goes into that. I've got a quotes and gear section. So this is where I put any kind of worksheets we're working on or uh, quotes from companies, et cetera, et cetera. We have a folder for the capture file, and then there's a general archive folder for other stuff that doesn't fit in there. So you can see that all of this stuff is, is organized pretty neatly into these folders. So that's kind of my, my, my working folder. And then this right here, this production, this is actually shared from the production manager of the company. So I don't touch anything in any of these other folders. All my stuff is under here under lights. If I collapse these a bit, you can see again, I've got a numbering system. So we got plots and paperwork, marked scripts, show files, cue sheets, work notes. Within plots and paperwork then, I've got an archive, I've got the current revision, and you notice here, whoops, this is, <laughs> I just noticed a problem with this. So this is the wrong number, but you see these numbers in theory would correspond. Every single file name also has that exact same, that letter and number system in there. Um, I keep in my in my production Dropbox here, I keep those folders as a, as a blank thing. So when I do a new show, all I gotta do is copy paste these right in and I've got them ready to go. We also, with our paperwork, we do uh, we you know we do digital scripts and so we'll export PDFs of the script each night and it'll all go right into those folders that you saw in that marked scripts folder which is super helpful for people. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit deeper. Uh, what light goes where? Again, this might be some uh, repeat information for some of you, but hopefully not for everybody. So this is the first thing in determining what goes into a light plot, right? Is figuring out where I need my lights to go and where do I need to, where do I need them to go? Where do I need to put them and where are they going to point? So the first thing I do is I figure out on my stage how I can divide that stage up into focus areas. So my focus areas are typically anywhere between eight to 12 foot in diameter. And if you look at it, it's kind of like a, almost like a clone stamp thing here, right? I figured out the first one and then I copy pasted that over and over and you can see these letters on here. So it goes all the way around this set. I got all the way up to P. Um, you notice I went from N to P. There's also no I there. The reason I do that is just the same reason that a lot of your theaters are probably missing a row I, because it's really easy to confuse I and uh, O with numbers. So I do that sometimes with multi-cable as well. So A, B, C, et cetera, et cetera. So from there, I figure out what systems of light I wanna have in each one of those areas. So when I say systems of light, I'm talking about things like top cool light, top warm light, top, uh, backlight, front light, et cetera, et cetera. Once I figure that out, this is kind of, as, again, a general rule. It, it varies from show to show. But once I figured out where I can hang a top light, let's say in area C, I can then copy paste that over into my other areas. And I do that system by system and I very quickly can can make a light plot happen. If you notice, uh, if any of you have watched on my YouTube channel, I have a time lapse of, of me doing a plot from start to finish all over the course of a day. And in that you can kind of see this workflow happening a little bit. You can see me figuring out focus areas and then copy pasting fixtures and, and going from there. A uh, question came in, how do you decide the amount of overlap between focus areas? So I don't have a necessarily, like a necessary rule of thumb for this. What I do is I, I will draw cones and I'll see where the, where the overlap is gonna happen at about six foot in the air, five foot five to six foot in the air, because that's where most people's faces are gonna be. And I'll show you that in one second. So hopefully you've seen this before. You know that uh, uh, if you don't know, hopefully you're learning now that these numbers that we see on our source fours or on a lot of our fixtures, what do those actually mean? So those have to do with the, the spread of the, the beam spread of the light as it's coming out of the front of the lens. So I know that a 19 degree light at five foot away is gonna be one foot eight because I can measure 
the distance uh, between the two edges of that cone coming out of the light. So at five foot it's this, at 10 foot it's this, 15 foot it's this, 20 foot it's that, et cetera, et cetera. And the cool part about angles is that the it doesn't matter what scale you're working in, that angle is never gonna change. So I can, I can lay a 19 degree protractor or whatever I wanna use for that over top of a plot or over top of a, a scenic drawing, and I can see what a 19 degree light is gonna do no matter where I put it. A good visual example of that is this. So you're looking right now at a section view of a, of a set and this little cone that I have right here, let's say, I don't know exactly what it is, but let's say it's a 19 degree, it looks a little too big for that, but I can now see visually in two dimensions exactly how big that light is gonna be when I go to lay it out or when I go to hang it in my space. So that's kind of how I figure out my overlap. If you imagine this in a, in a, a top-down view instead, I would be able to see where those cones were gonna overlap and know if I'm gonna have too much of a fall off between between uh, between my fixtures or not. So that's that. I can also do it, so here's a, a bigger example. This is done very simply. This is, I did this as a front view to figure out how big my high sides needed to be. So I drew these little sticks here. These are, I think are probably six foot tall sticks. And then I just drew cones out from every single one of these potential hanging positions to see how the light would cover and how the overlap would work. And then from there, I went in and measured the angle and that told me, okay, that's gonna be a 19, that's gonna be a 14, et cetera, et cetera. Any questions about that? Great, oh, can I elaborate? Elaborate on what exactly? <laughs> on the last one. Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, what I'm doing right now is, uh, let me give you a better example actually. I can pull up the, a Vectorworks drawing that will show you this a little bit better. I'll draw it for you in, in real time here. So let's say I was going to, I wanted to figure out these three high sides right here, okay? So right now this is a 36, this is a 26, this is a 19, right? Um, let me switch my screen share over to be full screen, stand by. Okay, now you should be able to see the whole thing. So I know that the, those three fixtures are what I chose there, but how did I figure that out? So what I'm gonna do is up here above, I'm gonna move all this crap out of the way first. Just gonna move this out of the way for now. Well, my computer is trying to move it all out of the way. It doesn't like live streaming and doing vector works at the same time, but we're getting there. Okay, so what I can do is I can draw some lines up here from my proscenium edge. So to do that, I just anchored over this a little bit. Um, let's first, I'm gonna draw my ground. So this is, I'm gonna make a front view of my stage essentially right now, right? So I've got it on center line here. I'm gonna draw a line up here, I'm gonna draw a line up here, and then I'm gonna come into my section, I'm gonna measure exactly how tall my proscenium is, 28-ish, eh, okay. So now I can come over here, and I know that I can draw two more lines, one at 28 here, straight up, another one, uh, another one from here, I'm gonna hover here to anchor, there. And now this little box, I'm gonna delete these other ones, this little box you're looking at right here, this represents my proscenium opening. So let's then say, okay, I'm just, I'm not gonna spend the time to measure it right now, but I could draw, I'm gonna draw my electric right here, whatever height that happens to be. I can then do the same thing. I can draw lines off of these fixtures to figure out exactly where they're gonna hang. So I'm just gonna do a little temporary tick there. That's one of my fixtures. And now I'm gonna draw another line that is six foot tall here. It's no different than putting in like a human figure. It's just a little bit easier to draw that six foot line. So now I know the source of my light is right here. My person is right here on center. And let's say I wanted to have three focus areas across, which is probably too few for this, a stage of this size, but here we are. Uh, now I've got my three, three people here. I'm gonna draw a cone coming out of this light that's gonna cover this person completely. 
I'm going to do another one here that's going to say go from here. And now again, I'm just kind of roughing this in for the purposes of this demo. And I could do as many of those as I wanted. And then I come in here and I use my angle measurement tool. And this tells me, okay, that is a 30 degree light. And this one is a 21 degree light. So I would choose a 36 and a 26 for that. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense for you. Um, and you can see how powerful this can be. Obviously this is a very rough kind of crude example, but it's an easy way to figure out uh, how, what size lights you need. Now, of course, you're only looking at this when you do it this way. Remember, you're only looking at this in one direction. So it's helping you if you're looking at it from the front with your degree this way, but it might not help you upstage downstage wise with depth. So in order to do that, you can really just do the same thing from here you could draw lines coming straight out but it gets a little more complicated because you have to deal with angles and stuff like that so i will dive more into this kind of thing in my vectorworks tutorial on thursday because i don't want to go super in depth on vectorworks tonight um, but i will make sure that i include that i'm going to write it down beam spread because i'll show you how to how to use the tools built into vectorworks even to draw the beam for you to help you figure that stuff out but again, I don't do a lot of that. I do most of my stuff in two dimensions. I'll use the section, I'll use the front, and it's quick and easy to figure out. Because now that I have that proscenium drawn, I don't have to draw it again. I could put anything I want anywhere. And if a scenic designer gives you a, a two-dimensional front elevation of a set, ooh, that's even better. Okay, uh, let me switch back over my share here, stand by. I have to share just the actual window from Keynote because I can't actually play the keynote presentation without it taking up all of my monitors, which is a, is a very dumb thing from Apple. Anyway, okay, so let me show you one more uh, example of this. And uh, Sebastian, I'll answer, that. I'll answer that question towards the end that you just had there. Uh, so let's do a quick little demo. So grab that piece of paper you had, and I'm actually gonna stop my share for a moment here so you can see, you can see me full screen. So I've got this piece of paper right here, right? If I look at the corner of my piece of paper, that piece of paper is 90 degrees. So that right there corresponds <clears throat> to a 90 degree source four. So remember we talked about earlier, I said that when you have an angle, the angle is the same regardless of scale. Sure, the size of the, the actual measurement of how big your light is gonna be might be different, but that you can visualize it no matter what because the, sc uh, the scale does not change. So if you hold this piece of paper up to your eye, wherever you're sitting right now, right on the corner, please don't poke yourself, and you look down the two edges of that paper, that's giving you a 90 degree field of view. So take that to your theaters, and if you're standing on a catwalk and you're looking at a piece of scenery and say, I don't know what size light I need from here, you could hold that up and help figure it out. Because what happens if we take that piece of paper and we fold it on that diagonal axis? Now we've got a 45 degree angle, right? Which is pretty damn close to, excuse me, pretty darn close to a 50 degree light. So now you can see, I can hold this up and I say, okay, this is what a 50 degree light is gonna do if I were to shine it from my exact point of view at wherever I want it to go. So again, that's 45. If I fold that in half again, again on the diagonal, now I've got a piece of paper that is what, 22 and a half, so it's about halfway between 19 and 26. So not perfect, but still, I can move this around with my eye and I can see exactly how big that light is gonna be. And then if I go one more time with it, now I'm down to 11 degrees or 11 and a quarter. So that's pretty close to a 10 degree light. So now I can see exactly what a 10 degree light is gonna do from wherever I'm standing. So again, very cheap, very easy, no math involved. You just fold a piece of paper and you can quickly figure out exactly how big your light is gonna be when it hits. Of course, now you need to be standing there, but you could also hold this up on a light plot. So if I, do I have any plots around here? Let me rip one off my wall, please stand by. So I've got this plot here, right? If I wanted to figure out what that light was gonna do from this position, I could actually, can you see this? I can hold up, I could put this cone on that plot, move it around and see in two dimensions exactly how big that light would be. Uh, I'm gonna leave this off of my wall for a second. So then the other cool thing about that is once you folded it all the way down into these smaller markings, once you open it back up, now you have uh, 
basically degree markings with each fold on your paper that correspond to basically you could say every 10 degrees it's not exactly perfect of course but as i open it all the way up it's you know 11 and a quarter for every single every single thing and no the scale of the plot would not affect it because again an angle is an angle no matter what so if, if the plot this is still going to show me like if i'm this angle is always going to be the same the measurement across is going to change because of the scale, but the actual, the, the, the tool to use this, the angle, it doesn't change based on scale. So the cool thing you can do with that, and I used to have a set of these, is you could print, um, if we go back to, let me share my screen again. Stand by. If you take a, a, a graphic like this, right, and you make these and you print them on transparency paper or transparency films, you could have a set of them, one for each fixture in your inventory, especially if, you, if you're working as a house electrician or a house designer or something like that, you could have a set of these transparencies in your inventory, put them over top of the ground plans you might get from a sync designer, hell, even hold them up to your computer monitor, because again, the scale is not gonna change, and then you can get an idea of what size light you need to accomplish uh, the, the, the job at hand. Another example of how that scale doesn't matter is, you know, that as long as your drawing is proper, is in scale, and the the distance from your lighting position to the air, to your focus object is proper, then you're gonna get, then that's it's all gonna line up. So, cheap little piece of paper. Hope you have some fun with that. Okay, so let's dive a little bit more into specific pieces of paperwork themselves. Um, so first thing I talk about rough drafts. So I do some of my rough drafts. Uh, I play around with them in Vectorworks. If I'm drafting the plot myself, I often will just start in Vectorworks and I'll throw some lights in. And again, if you watch that Mary Poppins video that I did, you'll see that I lay out an entire, uh, uh, kind of high side system. And then I go back and I scrap it all and move them to pipe ends. So I kind of just do the, I do the design process as I go. Otherwise, um, this is a, this, what you're seeing on your screen right now is an example of a plot that I didn't design, or excuse me, I didn't draft myself, and I actually marked it up within, on my iPad. So I took some screenshots of where I knew lighting positions were gonna be, and then I went in on my iPad, and I forgot what this program was because I haven't used it in a while. Uh, it may have been called Paper, I'm not 100% sure. And I drew over top of that and, and, and showed exactly what I wanted to have happen, and then I was able to send this off to the drafts person to actually turn into a working lighting plot. Which if you look at this picture right here, you can see there's actually some fixtures underneath there. Those are those were from Capture. So I actually laid this out in Capture first just to see what it was gonna do in three dimensional space. And of course, Capture is not a great, uh, Capture does r beautiful visualization and stuff and it does simple light plots, but for the level of detail I needed in a plot for a theatrical hang, Capture just doesn't cut it. So I'm able to do this and then uh, send this to, to, to a drafts person to draft in, in Vectorworks. Uh, yes, yeah, company just commented and said, Notability is good for things like this. I use Notability for all of my scripts. I used to love this app, this particular, this paper app, because it gave me a lot more control over uh, transparencies and colors and all that kind of stuff. Notability has come a long way though, but I use it for all my scripts. So that's rough drafts. And then of course we go into Vectorworks. So again, this isn't gonna be super in depth on Vectorworks, but if you look at this, this plot that you're seeing in front of you right now is actually the plot that this graphic from earlier was corresponding to. So if you notice here, I've got five little tick marks for those five lights. Here they are in real life, and they ended up being, it looks like, 319s and 214s to do this high side. This was for a redesign of the house plot that I did down at the Performing Arts Center down in Tampa. So this is in, uh, it's actually, I, think, I believe it's the largest stage south of the Kennedy Center. You can see it's a ridiculous amount of fixtures uh, in, the, in this plot. But you get the idea. So next up is Vectorworks. So I go through Vectorworks. Uh, I'd like to, again... I use organization in every single every single step of the way. Organization is absolutely key for me. Keep a really organized layering system, a really organized class system. Again, I'm gonna dive more into this on Thursday, but as a general rule, I treat layers as organizational tools and classes as styling tools. So if I go back over to this other drawing, see if I can move it up, you can see even then I've, I've adapted a little bit, I have some line breaks in here now, but it's still a very similar similar system I'm using even I think this is two years after I did the plot that was in this presentation so classes layers again we're going to dive into that on Thursday I also use a lot of save views and again they're all labeled and organized because there's nothing worse than getting a document that is that you can't 
figure out how many of you ever have ever gotten a SketchUp model before where nothing is labeled or a Photoshop document where every single layer is named something random. Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions here. Sebastian, you have your hand up. You have your hand down. Okay, uh, a couple questions in the chat then. A drafts person, do I mean one of my assistants or team members? Yes, so on that particular show that you just saw, Abby, Abby May actually, uh, gotcha, Abby May um, d drafted this plot for me. I also have uh, Jessica Krieger has done a bunch of plots for me, and I've got some other people who have done some drafting for me. Sometimes they're on the actual production team itself. Other times they're not. It's just somebody that, you know, I, I've, I've done that before where I, I, I don't have time or myself and my team don't have time to do it, so I'll send it off to somebody I trust and they'll they'll knock it all out and it saves me a whole lot of time. So again, it's this is a, a conversation for beer night tomorrow night, I think, but it's it's that question of save spend a little bit of money but save a little bit of time, which then allows you to go out and make more money. So Okay. Uh, so we talked about that, we talked about that. And then I also use a really, com not even complex, but a, a, a system of sheet layers to actually lay out all of my various paperwork the actual PDFs of the plots themselves. So if you look at this, you know, I've got a bunch of design layers here, but then all of the actual plots themselves are on sheet layers that are sized exactly to the piece of paper. And then they have a bunch of viewports that reference back to all of the various things that I need. So I'm doing very little work on the sheet layers themselves other than updating a little bit here. Uh, everything else is on design layers and it's being referenced in. So that allows me really quickly to go through and lay out a whole bunch of different pieces of the plot and different pages of the plot. We'll get to more on that in a second. Okay. So here's an example of a plot. This is 42nd Street down in, down in Atlanta at City Springs. If we zoom in a little bit, you can see all my fixtures here. They all have symbols. They have a bunch of numbers. Uh, these, they've, Some of them have colors written in front of them. We don't actually do that anymore at this particular space. But you can see there's lots of lots of different information. It kind of looks just like a giant map, and it's basically what it is. It's a map. It's a blueprint of exactly where every single light in the in the show needs to go. So I'll talk about those symbols in one second. Let's first let's zoom over to the title block here. So this is the title block. If you've again, if you've been looking at my stuff for a while, you know that almost all my title blocks all look the same. Um, we've got here at the bottom. This is this is my example. You don't have to copy this in any way. There's uh, there's millions of ways you can do it. What the, the the key thing to take away here is the information itself that is being conveyed within the within this title block. So I have the contents. That's the most important thing. What is this page? What is on this page? If there's no label of what it is, I as an electrician, as a manager, whatever, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I've got a page number. So this is again, this is you know the the footloose plot that I just did for the park show, that's 13 pages long. So sometimes it'll say one and I'll put of and then the total number of pages there. So you can, you know if you have the full set or not. We have the scale and we also have the page size. So some might say, well, why are you, why are you saying what page size it is as well as the scale? Does that matter? And it does matter. And the reason is because if I were to print this, this plot, this, this particular plot is designed to be printed on 36 by 24 paper, or that's arch D I think it is. Um, if if that if you shrunk it down and you printed it on a different piece of paper, it's no longer in quarter inch scale. It's in a scale of some kind because the relationships are still the same, but it's not in a measurable scale. So what this allows the the people using it to do, the people reading it to do is look and compare and say, okay, well this is clearly on the right size piece of paper, so I can measure this in quarter inch scale. Above that, I do a little credit section. So this has the director information. It has my team information. How much I put in here really depends on how many people are involved with the show. If I've only got like a single assistant, then I'll go ahead and I'll list the production manager and all that kind of stuff too. It really just depends on, on the show itself. I've got the show title, so we know what show it is. Above that then, I've got, uh, oh, I guess I missed a thing. I've got a revision history here. So this revision history, if you notice, this corresponds exactly to the, the numbers and letters we talked about before. So the current revision is bold and got these little carrots by it, has a date, has who do it, who, who drew it. And all of this stuff is BO2 loaded in revision two. This would be exactly the same text that is on the corresponding paperwork. The question came in, do I typically do quarter inch scale? 
it really depends on the theater. I try to, I, I, my goal is to fit as much information on a single piece of paper as I can, but I've got plots that are a quarter inch, plots that are half inch, plots that are three eighths. Sometimes like if I'm doing a weird zoomed in view, it's in three quarters or one inch. Uh, but usually most of my plots end up being quarter inch ish uh, with some exceptions. Okay, so we talked about that. We talked about the revision history. Again, that just helps me to know Again, like if you were walking in with a piece of paper and it's got AO2 on it, you say, wait a second, and you could go look at this and see, wait a second, we're supposed to be on BO2. Okay, next here, a uh, question just came in. Do I make title blocks on a class layer and move them in with a viewport? Yes, so I don't use the title block tool in Vectorworks. And honestly, the only reason for that is because I've never used it. I, I mean, I, I started this system many years ago and it's stayed and it works for me. So I, I'm willing to give it a try, I just haven't yet. Basically, again, all of my stuff on every sheet layer is referencing a viewport. I'm gonna get into depth on this on Thursday, but even this title block information is all referenced on a title block viewport, or excuse me, on a title block design layer. And then I'm able to put in other information on top of it, things like the general notes, like that's just a white box, and this, this is a text field I would change with on the sheet layer. Uh, different scales for different pages. Uh, yes, yeah, sometimes it depends on what I'm doing. If if it's like front of house and overhead, I try to keep that stuff all in the same scale. But if I'm doing like detail drawings of particular scenic units or something like that, then the scale might change. Sometimes I'll even have multiple scales on the single piece of paper depending on what the needs of that document are. Okay, so moving up from there, designer info. It's actually my old title block. I need to update it. But this basically it has has my low is my old logo. It has my union stamp on there. It has contact information. I don't live here anymore, so don't think you can uh, you can find me. And uh, and then a little disclaimer that we'll see if it ever hopefully never has to hold up in court. Fingers crossed. But it basically says that I'm just responsible for the visual aspects of the show and not if it's improperly installed. Above that, I've got my show logos, my company logos, and then uh, on top of that we get into the actual really important stuff. All this other stuff has just been informational, but it doesn't it doesn't really help me in 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 hanging the show other than maybe the scale. The legend here is one of the most important things. So this is basically a picture of one of the symbols I'm using and then a key that corresponds to all the various pieces of information that could be on that symbol. So for instance, I know that my channel number is here inside of this circle. I know that my unit number is here in the middle of the body. I know that my template is designated by a little uh, uh, black dot with a G on it. My lens is gonna be designated here color in the front. Again, I don't even put the color in the front of the fixtures anymore because it just clutters up the plot. But this is a, this was a two year old plot at this point. And then I also have some common abbreviations in here. Uh, a couple of other questions came in. Do I always print an arch E? No, again, that really depends on the theater. Uh, I think most of my plots are actually arch D uh, and I, instead of E because D is that slightly more manageable size. But like that, that Strata Center plot, that's all on E just because the venue is so big that if, if I were to try to shrink it down and scale it any smaller, it wouldn't be readable. So I had to go with E. But I think most of my plots that I've, I've been doing lately have been on D size paper. But I have title blocks. I have systems like that ready to go in my base file for multiple pieces of, multiple sizes of paper. So if, if a, and I've had this happen, electricians like, hey, I really would love to have a, an E size of this. Could you do that for me? I can do that really quickly and I can knock it out. Um, okay, next up, general notes here. So ample, obviously these are pretty simple standard notes, have ample 119, 132 in black wrap. This is kind of my test to see if, uh, if electricians have read the plot or not, if they have a stack of 119 and 132 sitting there when we walk in the door. The other thing, this is, a, oh, this is such a pet peeve of mine, to please have all color, templates, accessories, everything loaded and ready to go. I wanna be able to go and just go quick through focus. If, I, if, if the gel hasn't been dropped yet, I, might, I just feel like I, well, I'm just going to go home and tell me when it's dropped and I'll come back because the amount of time that it's going to take to drop it is going to be less than the amount of time it's going to take to focus a light, wait a minute or two for each thing to happen. It just drives me nuts. I'd rather just pull a color out, focus it, drop the color back in than have to have somebody figuring out the color as they go. But that's a separate conversation for beer night tomorrow night. Uh, please have top hats and barn doors. And then this other thing here, instruments hung on 18 inch centers. So again, this is a, a theatrical lighting basics kind of thing. Overhead instruments are typically hung on 18 inch centers. So distance from clamp to clamp is 18 inches. Uh, instruments on a vertical pipe are typically hung on 24 inch centers. Again, those are general rules, not necessarily always 
adhered to. I mean, you can look at any of my plots that I have online. You can see that they, they're they usually within that, but there's going to be some that are at nine inch spacing, some that are bigger, some that are smaller, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then above that, we look at the actual symbol key as it renders. So this basically tells me what each one of those little symbols mean. So each one of them corresponds to a different kind of fixture. So we've actually made these, since this plot was made, we've made this a little bit easier because you can tell like, depending on the quality of your printer, it could be really hard to tell if these gray dots are these black dots, or, you know. So we've actually made the, the new symbols we use are better than these, but again, this is just on this old plot. You can see though, every single thing that I have in my show is designated here with exactly what it is. So as I'm looking, if I'm looking over here at the plot, I know, I know that if I look at this fixture, okay, there's no lines in this lens and it's got these little black dots. Come back over here, no lines, black dots. That must be a Luster Series 2, 36 degree, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. I do use now one thing I do use that is built into Vectorworks. I do use the 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 symbol key tool because I find it to be a little bit faster. Uh, but there are problems with it. I'm sure that many of you have dealt with problems with it. And again, we'll do a deeper dive into that on Thursday. Okay, so within that uh, within that plot, I also have a line set schedule. So I try to keep my line set schedules relatively uniform as well. This one actually never got completed because it doesn't have trim heights in there. But I've got the contents of each thing. I've got the I've got the di the distance from the plaster line. For some reason, this theater was installed uh, about a half inch off. So every single one of these is almost, oh, yeah, pretty much every one is at a half inch measurement, which just drives me nuts, but it is what it is. And then we highlight the electrics in some way. So on this older plot, you see it's just kind of done with this uh, black box. On the newer plot, if I zoom back over to my overhead view here, you can see we actually highlight the electrics in yellow. So you can see them a little bit better there. A uh, question came in, do I ever put the number of that fixture type used on the plot beside it? Yes, I absolutely do that. Um, I can do that easily within Vectorworks. The, uh, sometimes the, if you look at one of my plots and if it's, if it's not there for some reason, it's typically because there was some kind of problem with Vectorworks automatically counting them and I had to get the plot done so I just turned the field off because that information exists on another piece of paper. Obviously I wanna have it on the plot, but I'll be I'll I'll admit it that I've been guilty of that a few times where it just the counts will be wrong for some reason and I won't be able to figure it out. Light right will be right, the drawing will look right, but then the the this, the counting tool will be wrong, so I'll just I'll just get rid of that field. Um, another question: Do I decide the height of the line sets, or is it already set in stone? Uh, it's a it's a collaboration. So pieces of scenery are usually a certain height, and that's what's going to help determine for me exactly how how high my electrics and things need to be. That's a good topic. I'm going to write that down for Thursday as well. Because this has to do with how we use, how I use a section and how I use front elevations and stuff like that to figure out masking and figure out uh, electrics heights. Uh, another question about light right. Yes, so I use light right at the same time. And we're going to get to that in a second and again dive deep into it on Thursday. So this production of 42nd Street, this only had four pages to the plot. It had an overhead stage view. It had a front of house view. It had a on deck view. So this you could see there's some trusses and some movers and stuff like that here. Then it had a section view. So a section is not a side view. A side view would be different. So if you think about a section, if you think of a book and you were to take that book, or in this case, I'll take this laptop. Let's say that this laptop was my theater and I'm looking at it from the front and I open that up, it's like I'm splitting it right down my center line and I'm looking at either side directly through my center line. So often this is called a section at center or a section through center and not a side view. So what I'm looking at here is if, I'm, if I was standing at center and I was looking uh, stage left or house right, exactly what I'd be seeing. So this you can start seeing here, there's people in here, you can see these little lines, these are sight lines. So Natalie, we will, if you come in on Thursday, I'll talk about those and how we use those to determine all of these heights and things like that. I even have them drawn all the way up here from these people in the balcony. We had to do it for a gentleman's guide that we just did. If you, if you follow me on Instagram, you know I posted some videos, I was sitting all the way back here in the back as we set a trim height on our apron trusses because I wanted to make sure that we could, uh, that it would be, that the people back there were gonna get, weren't gonna get cut off at all. So, section. So Vectorworks, if you're a student, it's completely, if student or teacher, Vectorworks is completely free for you. You can go to student.myvectorworks.net. 
you sign up for an account, all you have to do is provide proof of enrollment or proof of employment. So if you're a teacher, you just upload your, your faculty ID or a pay stub. If you're a student, you can upload a copy of your schedule or your student ID, and you can use this program completely free of charge. The only limitation on it is that there's gonna be a, a watermark at the top and bottom of any PDF that you generate. Um, it just says Vectorworks Educational uh, Version. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, Vectorworks Educational Version. And then, of course, the file itself is watermarked. So if you were to then import things into another one, it's going to then watermark that file. So, but again, as you're learning, as you're using it in school, there's nothing wrong with having those watermarks on there. That's what it's designed for, um, is, is for you to learn. So Harrison just had a question about, do I have any examples of set electrics drawings? I do. I will have to find them. So once we get through everything at the end, uh, that way I don't have to, everybody has to wait and watch me navigate through the computer, I will find some set electrics drawings to show you. Um, okay, so completely free. Then the next piece, the next tool that I use all the time is LightWrite. So right now, um, uh, LightWrite is, it's, if, if, if your institution, if you're at a college that has an institutional license, John has made it available for the students of that school, I think through, I wanna say June, it might be the September, I'm not sure, um, to have a license at home. So otherwise, LightWrite is $135 for an educational license. Basically what we use LightWrite for is a quick way to manipulate a lot of data at once. Now, LightWrite can also generate all of your reports, all of your schedules, all of that stuff like that. I personally don't use it for that. I use my own paperwork software that I, that I made um, that I talked about on Sunday, but I do still use LightWrite all the time as a quick way to manipulate a lot of data within Vectorworks. So again, I encourage you to go to my YouTube channel, look at that Mary Poppins video. You can get an idea of my workflow a little bit about how I use both of those programs back and forth in real time. Again, that's $135, mckernan.com, that's John McKernan who made it. You can buy it from any city theatrical dealer. So anywhere you buy your gel from, anywhere you buy your lights from, you can get a license of LightRite. You can also get it on several online retailers as well. Um, it's the industry standard paperwork software and it talks to Vectorworks, it does everything we need it to do. Okay, so uh, any other questions here? Good. Okay. Instrument schedule. So let's talk about instrument schedules for a second. An instrument schedule is a document that is broken down by position and includes all the necessary information you need for every single lighting instrument in your show. So broken down by position. So I've got positions, I've got position at the top here, and then I have unit numbers. Unit numbers, where are we at here? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Sorry, unit numbers are these little numbers here that are on the fixtures themselves. Unit numbers are numbered from stage left to stage right and from the proscenium out. So if, I'm, if I have a position in my house, the fixtures closest to the proscenium are gonna be, are gonna be one, fixtures farther away are gonna be the higher numbers. Same thing on stage. If, my, if I've got a position that runs upstage, downstage, the things closer to that proscenium are gonna start with unit number one. So unit one is here, unit two is here, three is here, et cetera, et cetera. I can then go back to this instrument schedule and I can see, okay, unit one, and I can see every piece of information I need to see about that particular fixture. As a designer, I'm typically only turning in plots that have the base information on them. It's gonna have a channel number. Sometimes I'll put the gobo in the color, but if it's a cluttered plot, all I'm putting on there is the channel number and the unit number, and of course the fixture symbol. And then the electricians, it's their job to use this other paperwork to lay out the rest of the show. Because you can see like all, all of these various numbers, that would be a lot of information to try to put into that plot, especially when you've got, let's say 20 lights clustered together in one position. So again, organized by unit number uh, within, <clears throat> within each position. A uh, question came in, what about dance towers, booms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we label ours from uh, the top to bottom, I think. Let's take a look, see real quick here. Yeah, we label ours from the top to bottom, so the top of the ladder down. And then if you've got, say like this, we've got them double hung, again, we start at the top downstage fixture. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, you notice on this paperwork, has the same information that was on my, on my plot earlier. I've got a show name, I've got that revision date right here. This, <laughs> this prints a timestamp to the second. Not really necessary, of course, but that's just what, I've never went in and updated the code to just print the, the time and, and, and uh, 
minutes or hours and minutes. Then it's also got contact information up here. So this is, I'm able to change this within my software to whoever needs to be printing this particular piece of software, excuse me, piece of paperwork, but it's got contact information on every page as well. Talk about unit numbers. Okay, other things that are on this, this particular this particular schedule, if we go back to it for a second. You see we've got a channel number, we've got a dimmer number, a circuit number, and a DMX address. So what's the difference between all of these various things? So a channel number is gonna be the number that we type into the board to turn the light on and off. As a design, as a theatrical designer, this is the only number that I actually care about because I wanna be able to sit down behind that tech table and say channel one at full, and I want that light to turn on. All of the other stuff that's going on behind the scenes doesn't really matter to me as long as I have those channel numbers. So when we get to magic sheets in a second, you'll see the only numbers that are on them are channel numbers. We also have circuit numbers. A circuit number is gonna be whatever the actual physical connection of the light is plugged into. So if you're, if those of you who are working in educational theater, you probably have what we call a dimmer per circuit system. So you probably have a dimmer rack somewhere in a closet with let's say a couple hundred dimmers in it. And then dimmer one corresponds to plug number one on your front of house catwalk or on your first electric. That's a dimmer per circuit. When we're dealing with portable installations or temporary dimmers or things like that, we can run, we could run, we run our own circuits and we run our own multi cables that contain say six circuits in them. So now we might not necessarily have a system where circuit one or cable number one is going to correspond to dimmer number one. And there's different reasons for that. It can be reasons of physical location. It can also be uh, when we're planning out these portable systems, we want them to be phase balanced. And again, this is, that's a way deeper conversation about how to do all of that. Um, there's some excellent books on it that I can re recommend for you if anybody's interested. Um, but but the, very quickly, you can have circuits that don't correspond to the dimmer numbers. So circuit, where the light is physically plugged into. Dimmer, this is the actual device number that is doing the, the dimming of the, the actual electronic dimming of the fixture. This is the thing that my board is telling to turn on, turn off my individual light. We talked about unit number, that's the number on the actual pipe. And then we have DMX address. So DMX address is, sorry, Oh, look at that, I have definitions all ready to go. <laughs> I should look ahead when I do this. A DMX address is uh, how I am telling from my lighting console, I'm, how I'm telling an LED or a moving light or any multi-parameter fixture, how I'm giving it information. So for a single, a symbol, I'm gonna slow down. For a simple dimmable fixture, for a source four, that's gonna take a single address of DMX, and that address is go going to correspond with the dimmer number that I have. So I know if my board is telling, all right, dimmer one at full, it's going to turn on whatever I have plugged into dimmer one, okay? And it's going to, uh, that it's telling it that by saying address number one at full. When I have something like an LED or a moving light, now I've got multiple parameters that I have to control. If you watched my thing last week, we talked about how we can have color, we can have edge, we can have pan, we can have tilt. Every single one of those parameters takes up an address of DMX. So now instead of just a single one, I've got, let's say, a color source par, for example, that takes up at least four, if not more, four addresses of DMX. I've got a red, a green, a blue, and a lime, depending on what mode I'm in. So now I've got to start laying those things out where they're all going to fit within my data system to be able to be individually controllable. So again, this is a, that's a bigger concept than just talking about paperwork, but hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, and if you have more questions about it, I'm happy to answer them after we're done with the paperwork stuff. So uh, another question came in. Am I the one choosing circuit power info or is that a production electrician? Typically that would all be the production electrician. The one, ex the one uh, exception to that is the big outdoor show I do every year where my team and I do all of the prep paperwork because we have to get all that stuff done months in advance before the, even, before the production electrician is even necessarily hired. So, but on a typical theatrical show that I do, all I'm doing, all I care about is the channel number. Everything else that's happening is happening completely independent of me. And I don't, I, saying I don't care is the wrong way, but in, in theory, I really don't. Because again, I just want to be able to turn a channel on and have that light turn on. So, okay. Uh, so the next piece of paper we'll talk about is a channel hookup. So this is very similar to an instrument schedule, only this is organized by channel number. So what this allows me to do is do a quick patch on my console. I can say, all right, channel one is going into dimmer 56. Channel three is going into channel 50, uh, dimmer 57. That should give you a, 
these are all LEDs. Let's look at the bottom here instead, where it's actually individual. So here's a source four. Channel 61 is going into dimmer seven. Channel 62 is going into dimmer 23, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a quick way I can go through. Let's say I didn't have all these cool tools where I could just import my patch into my EOS. Say I was using an expression console or I was using uh, you know, even a, 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 any other console that doesn't support any kind of import. I need this physical patch sheet to be able to go, okay, this goes into this, this goes into this. Mm -hmm. Uh, question him what is the load the load column that is the that is the wattage of the fixture so 750 watts for a source four i don't know why i didn't print the w next to it it should and then of course these are all leds so they're less oh that's really interesting some of them say 150 and some say 130. look at that never noticed that before uh, and theaters that i work in are most constant circuits mixed with dimmers is a separate set of blah blah, blah. Yes, so the, the main place I'm working right now is City Springs down in Atlanta, and that venue is actually it's designed to be a mostly LED house. And so I think on, on Gentleman's Guide, which is this plot I keep showing you here, I think we only had maybe 10 incandescent sources on the whole show. Everything else was LED. So in that particular venue, they have two sensor 96 racks for this 1100 seat proscenium house, but every single module is a through power module. So it's able to be switched between relay and dimmed um, and uh, we, we change it based on show, sh from show to show. So the, the last theater that I actually was a part of the design process in was a the private school I used to work at in New York. We were building a brand new venue and we were building a hybrid venue of a, of a the proscenium was gonna be a hybrid between LED and, and tungsten and the black box was gonna be 100% LED. So for the black box, we put in all hot power and in the uh, other theater, in the proscenium theater, we put in uh, two sensor racks and there were dedicated relays at every position. So every plugging strip had, you know, five or six dim, uh, non-dim circuits on them that went back to relays. And every like plugging box that was throughout the house had at least one Edison hot power on it. If I was designing a theater now, of course, this was this was four years ago when we were designing this. If I was designing a theater now, I'd do very similar to what City Springs ha or Sandy Springs has. I would do through power modules. You know, obviously there's a budget implication to that, but if you can do it. Through power modules are great because then you switch what you need and, and you call it you call it good. Okay, uh, so there channel hookup organized by channel circuit hookup same information again but it's organized by circuit. So these things can be useful to different people. A dimmer tech who's hooking up the dimmer racks might want this organized by dimmer. They're going to want a dimmer or a circuit hookup. Uh, the programmer is going to want a channel hookup to be able to do their patch. So once you have the data in a program, it's really easy to manipulate that data and just print it sorted by a different order. If you've ever worked with a spreadsheet program like Excel, you know that, you know, you could have all these as rows in Excel, sort by column A, sort by column B, and you're good to go. So again, for that park show that we do, here's a here's an example of another thing. We, we actually lay out circuits on top of that with these kind of color code things. Uh, this is more of a visual tool to help. So we see like here's A, here's B, here's C. Zoom in a little bit, you can see that a little bit better. So these are all corresponding to the circuit numbers. And again, this is that project I do every year where we do do what my team and I do do all of this, uh, this layout work in advance. The reason that they're split up into groups of six is because we use what's called Socopex cable. Hopefully most of you have seen this before, but if you're working in, 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 in educational venues, again, with that dimmer per circuit kind of system, you probably have never seen this. So this is a way, th this cable is basically probably about that big around, and it's a way to take six circuits from one place to another. So this Socopex connector can cook right into the back of a touring dimmer rack, or you can have break-ins and break-outs for it that connect to it, and, and you can break these out into stage pins, L520, L620, Edison, anything you need. Uh, to move move a bunch of circuits into different locations really quickly. Um, here's a picture of that dimmer hookup as well as some of our, of our labeled and prepped Socopex cable. You can see here this one, this has got some stage pin to Edison's on there. Um, every single cable of course is labeled, the, the actual junctions on this touring rack are labeled as well so that when the electricians go to load this in, they plug cable A into port A here and, and they're good to go. It's kind of like putting together a big puzzle on this particular show. Uh, of course, then I also print, this is a multi-cable schedule. So if you're with me on Sunday, you saw this. I'm able to figure out exactly what cables are going into each one of my uh, my Socopex connections. What, another question come in. Do I have another system if I'm using multiple dimmer racks? What do you, what do you mean by that? Um, 
I'm using multiple dimmer racks, I would typically, because these labels right here, of course, on the sensor rack or ABCD, whatever, if I'm doing multiple racks, I would I would just keep that numbering going. We did last year, we actually, I think we had, was it last year or the year before we had two racks? And I just, I did A through, you know, whatever this goes to, and then I start with AA if I need to. Um, it, that's really kind of up to the discretion of the electric, you know, people do it in different ways. That's the way I like to do it. I just like to keep to the lettering and numbering system. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers that. Okay, multi-cable schedule, do a color schedule. <clears throat> so this is basically what cuts of each color that I need and what size I need them in. Lightrite can generate all this for you. I also have it in my paperwork software, so it'll give me a total number of cuts. I also have a little completed field over here. Um, this was a, a preliminary version of this. So you notice here I put do not pull because I didn't know what size this was. This theater was still using, they still are using T3 strips. Um, so I needed the gel, exact gel size on that for that. Um, yeah, uh, Melissa, you're absolutely right. So Melissa just commented in the chat, sometimes you see ABC for conventionals and then ML1 for power moving lights. Absolutely right. So on the particular show that you're looking at here, we actually did a, a combination of through power modules in this rack again. So everything we did was still on a lettered and numbered circuit. Um, for Footloose that we're doing, we have a, we're do, we actually are going down to a 24 circuit rack because we're doing very few dimmed fixtures and most of it's going to be on, on uh, PDs instead. So we're going to do kind of more of what Melissa is saying and have a separate numbering system for our conventional stuff and then a separate one for all of our, all of our hot power stuff. I think the takeaway from that is like you're going to find it different ways no matter what. As long as there's consistency within the particular project or the particular particular company you're working for, that's what's important here. So you know you don't want two different kinds of schemes going on on one show because all it's going to do is confuse you. Okay, we also have Gobo paperwork. So we have Gobo count sheets. Um, this is again an example from my paperwork software. Shows you what Gobos. This gives you a little of a readout of what go what what units those Gobos go in. I generate this as well, it's a position schedule. So this has all my positions that I use within the show. It has uh, trim heights, it has uh, weights, it has loads, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously you can see this would be super helpful if you're working in a proscenium fly house because you could sit there and hand the, fly, hand the head flyman on your first day in the space of an exact weight sheet, obviously without cable, but you could add the cable in if you figured it out. Just a, a weight sheet of, uh, this is exactly how much my first electric is gonna weigh. We use this because on this particular show, this is that outdoor show I do, there's a crane that lifts these positions into, into place. So the, I, we tell the crane operator, right, this load is 562 pounds, you know. Uh, data line schedule, so again, this if you were with me on Sunday, you saw this, shows you what data line everything is on as well as what order it's in. This is not typical for every show that I do, this is just the, the big outdoor show because again, it's out for a month, so it needs to be able to be troubleshot easily. Uh, and then we get to magic sheets. So magic sheets are probably the, the, the single most valuable piece of paperwork that I use. I mean, it's the only real piece of paperwork that I use as a designer when I'm actually in the theater space. It's a single document that simplifies that entire, every piece of paperwork you just saw, every plot simplifies that entire rig down into a single page, sometimes two page, two pages and allows the designer to quickly find and recall channels and groups during programming. So this is a, a, a American concept, um, doesn't necessarily happen in other parts of the world. I couldn't imagine doing a show any other way at this point because I don't wanna look at a giant plot. I don't wanna memorize all my numbers. I wanna have that piece of paper in front of me that has all of my stuff on it. Um, it's a simplified visual representation. So what do I mean by that? If we look back at this one for a second, if you look at this, every single one of these little squares, let me turn on my annotator here again. Every single one of these squares, so this square right here, this square right here, et cetera, et cetera, these all represent different systems of light within my show. And again, we talked about systems earlier. System is a, a top cool, top warm, front cool, front warm, et cetera, et cetera. And it's basically, a, this is, is, a, is a representation of where every single one of those lights is gonna hit on stage. So if you look in really closely here, you see that I have, I can't see, you, you see that I have little, my focus areas are underneath inside, underneath this, underneath these numbers, if I zoom in really close here, and you see my set is underneath there as well. So I know when I'm sitting at the tech table, if I turn on channel 46, it's gonna hit, hit right here inside of this house unit. I know if I turn on channel 43, it's gonna hit right here downstage center. 
and I know it's going to be front warm and it's going to be R302. Same thing, I know if I turn on channel 3, it's going to be my top cool light downstage center. Hopefully that makes some sense. So then the question comes up, why not just use the lighting plot, right? Why wouldn't I just have the piece of plot, the piece of paper on the uh, on the on the tech table and figure that out? Well, the an there's two answers for that. One, because again, as you've just seen, several of my plots, they can be multiple pages, and that's pretty common to have multiple pages of plot. The other thing is, it's really hard to find information quickly. So if I look at this plot right here, if I want to turn on this top Parnell system, I would have to move my eyes from fixture to fixture to fixture and see all of those numbers. Instead, I'm able to condense all that information down into this single square and see exactly where those lights are all by themselves. So it's kind of like having miniature versions of the plot that only show the fixtures themselves that are in that particular system. And then in addition to that, it's only showing where they're hitting. It's not necessarily showing where they're coming from. A question just came in, why are some numbers in bold? My bold numbers represent group numbers and then the italics are subgroups. So an example of that uh, is like group one would be all my top cools, group five would be this downstage lane. And there's no key for that on here because the, 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 the magic sheet is very personal to the designer or to the team. And so it's not something that really anybody outside of my team is ever gonna use. So I know what that means, that's all that matters to me. And again, it's very consistent from show to show. Uh, so how do I make my magic sheet? So I have a, a two hour live stream on my YouTube page that, that sh walks you through my magic sheet process. Um, over a thousand people have watched it, which blows my mind. So thank you for that. Um, and, uh, but it kind of goes through my whole process. So I start out with this, I start with a cheat sheet. And what this does is it's basically another report that prints out in channel or it just gives me channel, color, gobo and purpose. And I'm able to quickly take this I usually will make a paper version. So I'll sit there with my notebook and I'll kind of, I won't necessarily lay out exactly where I want it to be uh, on the page, but I will write the numbers down so I can see them and I can see where they're gonna hit and I make sure that I include everything. And then I use a program called Adobe InDesign in order to actually do the layouts themselves. So if you're interested in InDesign, it's part of the Adobe Creative Suite and that two hour live stream that I had. And I also wrote a blog post about it that explains how I do it. But uh, I, it, InDesign is used as a graphic layout tool. It's a way to make publications and documents really quickly. M lots and lots and lots of people make their magic sheets in Vectorworks or make them in, even in Excel or Word. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. Of course, like again, light, uh, vector, magic sheets are very specific to you as a designer and how you want to work. I love making them in InDesign. I work in InDesign very quickly. I think, you know, in that live stream, it's, it's almost two hours long, but if I wasn't explaining every single thing I was doing, I could probably knock out a magic sheet in a, in under a half hour for a very large rig. Um, again, nothing wrong. I just don't like using Vectorworks because Vectorworks is designed to be a mechanical drafting tool, a drawing tool for that. It's not designed to be a graphical layout tool. So sometimes I'll also do things like I'll take, uh, I've got these practical lamps, for example, that are on my set. So instead of like writing those down, I, the, the scene designer for this show was Frank Chavez. He, he had these beautiful watercolors that he did of the set. So I just took a screenshot of it and I put the channel numbers directly over top of it. So when I'm sitting at the tech table, I know that this little chandelier right here is channel 603. Sometimes I'll throw the gobo un underneath as well. I'll put directional arrows to show where the light is coming from. I've got color bars to show uh, what color it is and a lot of the shows I do now that are almost all LED they're not my magic sheets are not as colorful as they used to be you know this uh, this guy here is super colorful because I don't think there were any LEDs in this show it was all scrollers and all actual gel um, and then I got you know if I'm using color scrolls still which I'm still doing I did as recently as uh, uh, actually Mary Poppins that I'm supposed to be supposed to be in tech for yesterday that uh, got canceled use I think I had 20 some scrollers on that uh, and I have a, a color library here that I've built within Adobe and I will send, I'm gonna put the link to this in the, in the chat real quick. So on my web store, I've actually got, oops, I've got uh, Adobe Swatch libraries in addition to a bunch of other cool stuff. I have these Adobe Swatch libraries that you can buy. You can buy individual, uh, you can buy individual 
like a Roscoe book or a Lee book or a Gem book, or you can buy all of them. There's some discount codes on my Instagram if you're interested. And basically what it'll do is it'll pull in all of the various gels with uh, RGB CMYK values into any of your Adobe pieces of software. So I have found, I, I've got, I'd say they're 80% accurate. There's a few, especially some of the more pastel colors that are, I found that they didn't translate. Uh, and you know, I'm updating those as I go and then uh, re-release it as soon as I get those all fixed. But for the most part, you can see they're, they're pretty accurate. They come in with the color names and everything like that. So again, follow that link. You can check that out. Um, I think, I don't remember what the discount code is, but you're welcome to, to check those out. I've got a bunch of other cool stuff on there too. So check that out. Okay, so that's that. Uh, I have also made magic sheets when I'm doing a rep plot, for example. I'll make a magic sheet that's a lot simpler. This is a this is a this is almost ten. This was eight years ago now when I was the the TD at a performing arts school. But this is doing the exact same thing, right? This has got several independent little systems of light and it's showing you where they're hitting on stage. So I know if I want, if I turn on channel eight, it's going to be kind of mid stage center and it's going to be top cool. Uh, I have a very similar visual style to all my magic sheets. So you see like there's a lot of them right here. I actually have sitting next to me, I've got a whole bunch of them too. <laughs> I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do with these. But you know, they all look very similar. And the reason for that is because when I'm going from show to show, from theater to theater, it's on the ground now. If I'm going from show to show to theater to theater, I want some kind of consistency in, in my day-to-day -day life and how I'm doing this. I don't want to reinvent the wheel every single time I do a show. I want to be able to go from, uh, and this has happened, I want to go from a tech table on Tuesday to a different tech table in a new state on Wednesday and be able to have a very similar magic sheet, very similar numbering system as well. I get that question a lot. Uh, how, do I, how do I number my channels? And a lot of that is all from uh, just consistency over and over and over. A uh, question just came in, what size do I make my magic sheets? I make them, oh, people are buying my stuff, thank you. Uh, I make these are tabloid size, this is 11 by 17. Um, I have a printer, I have a inkjet printer, I can print them on here, but this costs like a dollar or something like that to print at Kinko's or FedEx office, it's not Kinko's anymore. Um, and then I laminate them as well, typically, just because it's on the table and I don't, you know, I'll, I'll crinkle it up or I'll write on it if it's not laminated. So, you know, it's, it's cheap to do, but it, it makes a difference. I started laminating them when I was working outside a lot and it's just kind of has stuck now. And now I've got, like, I've got a stack of my bookshelf over here of, of like 20 magic sheets that are all that size and all laminated. Okay, so if you're interested in reading more about them, uh, you can scan this QR code right here. This will take you to my blog post about it. And you can um, you can read all about it. There's links to the video and stuff like that there as well. Okay, uh, a couple more slides here, and then I'll take some questions. Probably another ten minutes or so worth of content. Any? Uh, yes, actually. Do I ever? So questions came in. Do I ever use non-permanent marker on your magic sheet since you laminate them? Yeah, I've done that in the past. I'll, I'll use uh, if I need to do something temporary on them. I'll use wet erase markers on them because they're really easy. You can uh, the vis a vis markers. You can write on them really quickly and then and then erase it. Um, but typically, I don't write on them very often. If I do need to write, it's because I've made a mistake and it's a permanent change. So I will use a sharpie or something like that. Um, Another little trick I used to do that the, the, the wet erase markers just reminded me of it. I used to have, this was 15 years ago now when I was, when I was very young, um, I had a, a glass pane on my desk and I would actually put uh, ground plans and stuff underneath that glass and then I would draw on top of it with that wet erase marker so I could get ideas for plots and stuff like that. That's actually, I don't know why I don't do that anymore. I should get a piece of glass from my desk get cat paw prints all over it if I did that I guess okay so cue sheets so I start off I mark up all my scripts in notability notability is a is a is an awesome app I don't I know that there's an iOS version and a, and a Mac OS version I'm not sure if it exists on other operating systems or not but the best part about it for me is because I'm in the Mac ecosystem it works on all of my devices and synchronizes through iCloud. So I'm able to do all of this very quickly I can mark this stuff up on here I can then work on it on a computer if I need to back and forth back and forth um, and this is how I this is how I mark all my scripts anymore. I, I got when the iPad Pro first came out in 2015, I bought one and I have not printed a single script since November of 2015 when I bought that iPad. It's amazing for productivity because what it allows me to do is every single night during a tech rehearsal process, I can do a new export of that script and send it to the stage manager and they have all of my cues and I still have my script. 
you know, I, I would, I got so sick of sending my, you know, I'd have my binder, or I'd send it home with the stage manager, it would come home the next day smelling like smoke, and there'd be changes I would have need to have made, but it was my script, and so I didn't have it anymore. So being able to do this really quickly and easily has just been a godsend. And it's also great because I'm able to send the notability file to, uh, to Abby, let's say my associate on a show, and she can add her follow spot cues in, and I can go back and forth. The thing that I wish notability did was actually real-time collaborative notes. Um, I've also used a program called the QList, which is made by which is made by a fellow USA a, a designer. Um, it's a web it's a web based program and it's awesome. I've used it on some of our smaller shows. Actually, most of the shows that I was doing sound design for, we used it, and it was basically you're able to you're able to assign roles to different people. So again, if I was a sound designer on the show, I'd have a sound layer that I could work on. The lighting designer would have a lighting layer, and they could add all their their cues in, and it was all collaborative in real time. Um, but it, it just wasn't necessarily the right the right tool for the job when it came to the larger musicals that I work on. Um, have I ever used a spreadsheet for cues? Yeah, I mean, way back in the day, I, I used I used Google Sheets, uh, but now anymore, I use my own paperwork program for it. So I'll do uh, this is actually this was it says final, but it wasn't a full import. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with all of you, I don't do a whole lot of of cue sheets anymore. Um, most of the time I'm doing this, I'm doing this, this markup in the script and then that's it. Like I, I can, I'll export my cue list from the EOS and I'll, you know, I'll print a thing, but nobody asks for it. Nobody, I, I don't, I've had maybe, maybe one or two stage managers in the last couple of years actually ask for a cue sheet. And usually that was just so they could see cues they were calling. So what I ended up doing for that is you notice here, it says they have a called by field. So I have a, a cue sheet that I can generate that that will only print the call the cues that are called by the stage manager so what that does is it goes in and um, i export from eos i have all my i have a csv of all that data and then my program goes through and automatically figures out what's an auto follow what is being called by time code etc cetera, etc cetera. and i can print this report for for a stage manager to say exactly what cues they're calling but again like i i really I don't know that I've ever been actually asked for like a detailed cue sheet outside of school a very long time ago. Um, don't tell your teachers I said that though. Please do your cue sheets. Okay, so from there um, we've got follow spot paperwork. So we this this again back to the producers. We had three follow spots out there. Uh, this is the cover sheet. They each have you know cue numbers, light cue numbers that they're associated with, what they're doing, who they're on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is all um, all done in Paperwork Management Portal. If you wanna check that out again, go back uh, on my YouTube, you can see my thing from Sunday about that. Prints a master sheet, so the person calling them can, can I don't know why it's all gray, this is an older version of this, but it can see exactly who's doing what in what queue. A question just came in, do you create all of the queues in your portal and then import it to the board or the other way around? Uh, typically we do them in the console first. So uh, most of the projects that I'm doing now when I'm working with Dalton, my, my go-to associate and programmer, he will take my script uh, during one of the, you know, during the load-in process and he'll go through an EOS and put in blank cues for every single thing and label them all. And because we've worked together so often, if I just mark something on a, on a beat or something, he'll know that it's gonna be a swell. He, he just knows how my mind, our mind works, our minds work very similarly. So, uh, he'll go put all those blank cues in and then I'll re-import them back into PMP. Other times if, you know, I've done some plays in the last couple of years where there's only 50 cues in the show. And so I will, I'll go through and I'll lay that all out in PMP first and I'll get all my descriptions put in, all my timing put in. And then I've got a couple buttons where I can send all that information over to EO. So it really depends on the show, how we work. We work kind of both ways. Um, well, let's, so it looks like that's the last slide I have. So I'm gonna switch back over to camera view here. And I'm happy to take questions. We're about an hour and 20 minutes in right now. So uh, that's the end of the formal stuff. Again, I will be doing on Thursday night, a deep dive into plots and paperwork when it comes to Vectorworks and Lightrite and my workflow for that. And that one is gonna be very driven on participation. So I'm gonna have kind of a rough outline that I'm gonna follow, but I'm gonna rely more on your questions. So I'm gonna start showing you some stuff and then I'm gonna just see where the evening takes us uh, as, you, as your questions come in. And then of course tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern, I have my weekly Zoom hangout that I'm doing where you can just grab a drink and we'll just talk about how much the situation we're all in sucks and meet some new people while you're at it. So, okay, got some questions here. Do I prefer high sides together or having the mirror for each 
area. So to me, I define a high side as uh, as anything that's coming in at a distributed angle. So this would be, um, you know, evenly spaced across the pipe so the angle is the same in every single area versus a pipe end, which is all of them kind of clustered in to the, to the end of the pipe. And, you know, it, it for a rep plot, I usually I usually try to do what I would call a high side, and then but for a lot of my shows, I end up doing uh, pipe ends, and really the reason for that is because of available real estate on the pipe. You know, it can be really hard to fit a whole, you know twenty fixtures across a pipe to do whatever you need to do all distributed evenly when you've got a bunch of other stuff happening too, versus just putting them all at either end of the pipe. So. Um, lettering makes sense what party process do the numbers refer to so uh, this goes back to the this question is about my lettering and numbering let me show you my let me go back to the screen share again stand by share the whole screen this time all right here we are so let me go to the title block and just go to a page so basically the letters are the major revisions so like i talked about in that earlier slide it's the the load in the focus etc cetera, etc cetera. the numbers then correspond to revisions within those major things so like bo1 this was a submittal copy and then bo2 is our shop prep bo3 was the shop prep after we made some changes and then the actual copy we used for load in was co1 and then once we generated that we realized that we had to change some stuff with the house ladder so we re issued co2 so it's with stuff it's, it's stuff within those major revisions so think of it kind of like a hierarchy right you've got a b c d and then within those you have i think i've gone up to six before with some of them but typically there's only maybe one or two revisions for each major thing I've only filled up this this little block once, and hopefully that knock on wood that stays like that. Um, okay, do I prefer prepping at four wall? I saw their new Orlando shop. Blah blah. blah. Yeah, I uh, so four wall is my shop of choice. Um, they've always been really great to me, and you know I, I I value loyalty and I value those professional relationships that that you form along the way. Um, so most of the projects I've worked on in the last few years have been four wall shows. I've done some that have been PRG. I've done some that have, uh, actually, no, I think most of my recent projects have been four wall or PRG. Um, and I just, you know, it, it, that it, it's a hard question is because it really depends on the show. It depends on the budget. It depends on the producer. Producer might have a relationship with the shop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, I'll prep wherever I, wherever I can. <laughs> um, I don't do a lot of the prep myself anymore, but when I did, um, typically we bring in all of our own stuff like it, a lot of the shows that i'm doing that have preps the while it might seem like there's a big budget there's not necessarily a budget to have a bunch of of, of like actual hands from the shop there so a lot of times they're just giving us a bay to work in and we'll bring a couple of our electricians and stuff like that in and do it all ourselves we're not actually paying for the labor of that prep um so and yeah and, and every shop like, like you just said Melissa every shop has their own processes you know if, if you're working for a shop like Bandit for example uh, where it's more of an all-in-one kind of thing where you know you're you're doing the rig you're doing everything at once there's gonna be systems in place for that you know with Bandit the idea is that you can go from from Bandit a tech go from one Bandit show to another and know exactly what how everything is labeled again that consistency that that concise information is there so um, do I get my own copy of the scripts or do I get one from the SM? Uh, yeah, I mean, I always, I, I, I never buy, I don't buy the scripts. We get the scripts from the stage manager. Um, I, every show I've done in the last 10 years, this, the script is a PDF. I mean, it's just what it is. You, you, you know, I don't, I don't think I've scanned one. There's, I've always been sent PDFs of those scripts. Everybody, I mean, literally everybody uses a PDF of it, so um to do pretty vague uh question what are relays so relay is basically an on and off uh, think of a dimmer slot only it's on and off instead of dimmer uh, instead of actually dimming the, the 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 light on and off so i would use a dimmer for an incandescent source to dim it from zero to 100 uh or i would use a relay to control it say a moving light where i'm going to turn the power on or turn it off there's all kinds of uh complicated elect uh, electrical engineering reasons for the difference and why you shouldn't just park dimmers and stuff like that um, but that's beyond the, the scope of this <laughs> of this thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I actually have not done a uh, done a show in a Christie shop, so I don't really know. But again, yeah, they've got their own systems and stuff like that. 
uh, Vectorworks does not generate the dimmer patch. So when I do my my like you saw with that that the 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 outdoor show that I showed you the stuff of that was done in a combination of of Lightrite and my own software. So I use Lightrite again when I'm using Vectorworks to get all that information put in quickly, and then I use Lightrite to do phase balancing, and then from there I come in and I do all my actual printing of my paperwork in my own in my own software. So. All right, any other questions? Got a couple minutes left here. Um, what paperwork do I typically do versus what do my assistants do? Uh, it depends on the show. You know, uh, for Gentleman's Guide, which is the plot I've been showing you a little bit in Vectorworks today, I drafted that whole thing. But for Holiday Inn that we did at City Springs in December, Dalton drafted that whole thing. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on our schedules, depends on the budget you know um depends on any number of things uh, but when we're actually in the tech process typically it's an assistant or an associate who's doing the follow spot paperwork generating work note paperwork doing all that kind of stuff do i have a standard set of channel numbers yes i do and i can let me share this with you real quick uh let me share my main screen again stand by so i'm actually going to go back to my website for a second and if you go to my website and you go to blog it's mikewoodld.com slash blog one of these things that I wrote, I, it was one of these two Instagram, this was before you could like answer questions on Instagram, I wrote these, but I outlined my channel numbering system. And it looks like it's on Instagram questions volume two. Yeah, here we go. So I, I do, and uh, this is, I'm, I'm considering revamping this a little bit because I'm using a lot more moving lights in my shows now. But typically in the ones, so one to 99, this is gonna be my overhead stuff. So I almost always, channel one is almost always gonna be, well, is almost is always gonna be my downstage right top light. If it's a color system, it's gonna be my cool light. If it's an LED, it's gonna be an LED. So one starts there. Usually I start 101 for my front light, and then it goes up from there box boom wise. Uh, 200s for booms and ladders, 300s for my psych, or any drops I have. Specials go in the 400s. Moving lights go in the 500s. 600s changes. 700s would be follow spots if I'm controlling them from the board. And uh, do, 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 800s would be practicals. 900s are all my utility stuff like house lights, fog, conductor, stand lights, and then anything non-dim goes into the thousands. So what I'm working on right now is I'm, I'm thinking about changing so my moving lights or lower numbers just for programmer quickness. You know, it's, it's faster to type in one than it is to type in 501. So I might redo that. But the reason I, I stick to these systems, there's not necessarily a rhyme or reason to the system that I have right now. Uh, it's just what I kind of started with a long time ago and it's morphed into this. And it allows me to go from show to show really quickly and not have to relearn an entire thing every single time I sit down at a tech table, which is great. And again, like I say here, sometimes if I'm doing a smaller show, I'll keep them closer in number, or if I'm using, if I'm especially if I'm using an older console, which now again I'm not really doing much anymore. But if I'm using like an Express or something like that, I'm going to cluster everything much farther together so that I, because you can't do those big wide spans of numbers anymore, or back then. Um, did I make my own software? Any advice for people looking to do custom paperwork? Yes. So I based my paperwork software in a program called FileMaker that allows you to do all kinds of cool uh, relational database stuff. So that was the topic of my talk on Sunday a couple days ago. If you go to my YouTube page now, that entire thing is is up in its entirety under, it's either, on, I think it's on two playlists, it's in my FileMaker playlist as well as my how-to light, lighting paperwork playlist. So go check that out. Is there a piece of paperwork you love slash hate to do more than the others? Um, I love doing the magic sheets because even if I don't draft the plot myself, I will always do my own magic sheet. Um, typically, you know, when I'm typically doing a plot, I'm turning that plot in sometimes a month before I get to the theater, sometimes more than that. And I often have multiple shows that happen by the time I've turned in a plot to the time that I sit down to do the show. And so doing that magic sheet, I typically wait until right before load in or right before tech happens to make that magic sheet. And it allows me to kind of become intimately familiar with that rig again and know what's going on with it. And there are times too where I'll catch problems and sometimes it's too late and I'll have to send an email, but other times I'll be able to go back and fix a revision where I, as I'm laying out that magic sheet, it's the quickest way to find any numbering problems that you had or you know that place where maybe the wrong color got dropped in a fixture or something like that is in that. Um, I would honestly, and as far as hating paperwork, I would probably say uh, doing cue sheets. You know, I just, 
I just don't enjoy that. <laughs> All right, any other questions here? Ben, I will answer that question for you offline. Mentioned something about books. Yes, so that was with electricity. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about stage electricity, I would highly recommend this book, The Entertainment uh, Electricity for the Entertainment Electrician. I will put a link up to this on my website um, and on the, on the, actually I'll put it on the, the class page on my website as well as the YouTube description for this session once it gets up. So highly recommend that to check out if you're interested in learning more about stage electrics and, and, and it really gets into the, the actual like nuts and bolts of electricity, not necessarily, you know, how to hang a light. It's more about electricity itself. Okay, I'm going to hang out for about two more minutes. If anybody else has any other questions, feel free to shoot them in now. Otherwise, I hope to see you all tomorrow night for some for a nice drink, and I hope to see you Thursday night for Vectorworks and Lightrite. And I will be announcing next week's sessions probably by Thursday or Friday of this week. Tell your friends. <laughs> Buy stuff on my website. Bye. <laughs>